Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Socola, your host, and our focus is on mastering communication as an essential leadership skill so that you can command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal in any context. My guest this week is Marion Baldini. Marion is the CEO and president of KenCrest, a human services and early learning provider throughout Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Delaware. They serve over 12,500 people annually, including in early learning centers, as well as adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Marion's had over 40 years of leadership in executive planning, administration, academia, and operational oversight. She's an unwavering advocate for the equality and inclusion of people with disabilities, as well as early access to education for all. Marion's been recognized regionally and nationally by organizations ranging from the Philadelphia Business Journal to Lutheran Services of America, with awards including Most Admired CEO and Women of Distinction. Marion, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, before we get started, tell us what's your fun fact? Um, I bake for fun and also stress relief. So if it's very stressful, I've actually run out of flour and had to go to the acne and get some more. <laughs> so I and it really seems bake. like that sounds like it. And it sounds like a self-perpetuating problem. If there's too much stress, you overbake and right. no flour, which causes more stress. It's just exactly. this. I have to get more flour. It's okay. And what is your favorite? What's your go-to stress baking recipe? Um, I make a mean carrot cake and I can mm. make little carrot cakes. So then lots of people can have them. So that is one of my favorites. So I will be sending you my address and we'll right. be figuring this out now. But the question is raisins, nuts, and or coconut. Which ones do or don't um, belong? No, no, they, they, you have to be careful because they're allergies. So I just make a very good carrot cake with a pineapple in it. Mm. You would never know, but it makes the moisture. That uh, content, sounds so. delicious. Very good. I'm yeah. big on nut, the nuts and raisins, but emphatically well, anti-coconut. for you, for you, I'll do the raisins and the nuts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. They have to be golden, golden raisins. Beautiful. I love it. I'm an equal raisin opportunity there you go. Uh, there you lover. Go. Just yeah, no coconut. It's a textural thing. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, but, no. All right. So let's get back to Ken Crest. Tell us about it. What's your 30 second elevator pitch? We are approaching 120 years of service as a nonprofit, um, education and human services. And we are passionate about innovation. So if you um, came to us as with a child, an infant, even as young as right out of the hospital, um, we're going to help your child get a great start in life through early intervention and early learning centers. And then for adults who are experiencing developmental challenges, we're going to practice authentic inclusion. So you won't see a building with our name on it, but hopefully you won't even see us because we blend in <clears throat> and support people to have great life um, by walking alongside them and, and supporting them to learn and grow uh, at work, worship, uh, at, the, at the gym. Um, so if you want to do a little Zumba and you need a little help, we'll be doing that Zumba with you. So. Oh, I love it. Really the opportunity yeah. to participate fully in, in everyday life, just like everybody else. Right. I love it. What is the most important leadership communication that you had to learn in all of this beautiful service of life? And how'd you learn it? Um, I was uh, not interested in public speaking, not getting up in front of a group at all. In fact, my first lie in high school was to my teacher saying that I had laryngitis uh, and I couldn't speak in front of the class. Um, so by the time I got to work, my boss would just throw me into this situation where I had to speak. So I was pretty panicked. And I was explaining this to a colleague who told me that she had been trained as a minister. Um, so she, um, she said she would coach me. And um, so I said, okay, great. And I treated her uh, for something I could do for her, um, which was uh, interviewing individuals about their goals in life. So she sat in the back and she, um, she gave me feedback on each speech and I got better. Um, and I, I was no longer panicked. And the panic partly came from the back, fact that the, that agency allowed heckling. So you could be standing up in front of an audience and they would just start, you know, jeering and whatever. It was pretty awful, but. That does I, sound awful. Yeah, but I figured it out, and I uh, and I I made some great speeches. I mean, great. I no doubt, no doubt, yeah. and it's amazing to think that there are organizations out there. And of course, we don't know what kind of agency this was or what kind of uh, no. what kind of no. spaces. But the idea that any organization would be okay with some of its members mocking, heckling yeah. some other yeah. member, like what what kind of environment are we really fostering? That the irony yeah. of. Uh, yeah. You know, especially if it's an agency that's supposed to be helping people, <laughs> right. we help right. everybody else's people. We just torture our own. The right. the right. It seems like a leadership vision yeah. gap. I, I actually, from... in my speeches, the heckling was 
by the time I got good at it, there was no heckling anymore. Sure. Sure. So. Look, you learn to captivate. That's what this yeah, is all about, I did. right? I did. And I did. it's it's I think that's you've conquered most people's fears, which is the fear of being mocked in public, of being humiliated in yeah. public. So, yeah. um, but that sounds like a really good trade. It was, it must've been a lot of carrot cake you had to trade off for that, uh, <laughs> that kind of coaching. Yeah, no, I, I, I traded um, something that was a great learning experience, which was I interviewed the people that she supported in her program mm. about their life goals. Um, so these were individuals with um, intellectual disabilities mm. and she really wanted to know what they were thinking. So I just met with these individuals one at a time and learned their stories. It was fun. Mm, that's a beautiful it was, it service a to trade. Great trade. Great. I trade. love it. I love it. Yeah. Now yeah. tell me about a time when you made the wrong call and had to fix it. Who did you approach um, first and what did you say to them? Um, well, I, I, I made a wrong call recently, <laughs> so I don't, I don't think I'm going to ever not have the potential to make a mistake. Sure. Um, I gave an assignment to someone who, um, who seemed to want it, um, and then, uh, turned it into something that seemed like it would never get done. Um, and I got some feedback that um, it was not going well. The, it was a sub team on a project and um, they had mapped out this plan that in two years they would get the work done. <laughs> I was like, no, no, no. Um, yeah. So I found the person who was really passionate about it, who really wanted to get it done and wanted to get it done now. Um, so I went first to that person and enrolled their support um, and found out what their, um, what their ideas were. And they were very quick moving um, uh, big impact ideas. So I got them to say, yes, if I give them the assignment, will they take it? And then I went back to the first person and I basically said, I really have something I really need you to do. And I want to take this goal off your plate. And they said, thank you. <laughs> so, mm. yeah, See, that's so. interesting, isn't it? Because the, everybody, I, I know my brain went to the assumption and I'm guessing that a lot of people else out there were going in the same direction thinking, Ooh, the the per you gave a job to somebody a project whatever it was they did the plan and then you took it away from them because they right. didn't meet your uh right. hopes or requirements expectations they didn't do it in a way that you wanted and that, that could be embarrassing that could be you know the idea of the the shame or the anger etc you gave my project to somebody else and yet they turned around and said thank you so why right. did they say thank you um i don't you know i think sometimes people will do something because the boss says so um, and they'll try it and they'll, you know, they'll give it their best effort because the boss thinks it's important, even when it's not really appealing to their giftedness. So I think one of the things you have to figure out as a leader is, you know, when it, what is the right assignment for that person? Yes. Um, and how do you enroll to their giftedness? And so um, I think that the mistake I made was I didn't really read their giftedness right. Um, and then once I corrected it and read it correctly, off and running they are, you know, so things are happening. And both and, on both goals. And that, I'm curious as to the conversation that you had with that first person. How did you approach them not knowing how they would be receiving it? And, and I love the phrase enrolling to their giftedness. We're going to come back to that in a second. But when you approach them, again, not knowing how they were going to respond, how did you start that conversation? Um, I said, I have learned a lot since our last meeting of, about what it's going to take to make some of these goals um, achievable. And uh, in the course of that, I, uh, I saw some new opportunities. Um, so I think the opportunity is to advance both goals. But to do that, we need to bring in more support. Um, so uh, what I've decided, and I didn't make it an optional thing, what I decided was I'm going to split the goal into two parts. And I want you to lead this part, and I'm going to give the second part to this other person. And there's that's when the thank you came in. So. Yes. And I love how you approach that in a way that really helps to maintain the dignity of everybody mm -hmm. else. It's not that, you know, I didn't like what you came up with, but I've realized this is really big and you can't, right. I can't expect you to do this by yourself. So let's right. figure out who else right. will compliment you and will give you this piece and give them that piece. So I, I think that was such a great testament to leadership and honoring the person in a way right. that does not need to be quote unquote constructive feedback doesn't need no. to be anything along the, it's really recognizing no. this actually right. is too big right. for one person. I'm, I'm guessing you did not split it into two just so that you could try to help that person save face. It's like, no, you, no, no. I, I mean, we, we need to get the work done and, um, and I could see why the work would be a challenge for that person. I mean, nobody's good at everything. 
Right. You know, I mean, that's a fact. And that's why we have teams. Exactly. Um, and the, the, the team didn't um, miss a beat. I mean, nothing, nothing, no emotional tension or, or ensued or any people are happy. They're off and running and making things, you know, move along. Yes. Yes. And so going back to that phrase, I want to address it one more time so that people can kind of emblazon it in their brains. But the notion of enrolling to their giftedness, enrolling someone to their giftedness. Can you just give like a one sentence definition of what that means? Uh, because it's powerful. And I think it is something that if we internalize it, it can really be a driving force that helps us both make better decisions and articulate them better. Sure. So I think as leaders, we need to discover each person Mm -hmm. And what they, um, what their, where their best effort is going to um, be inspired. Where does their energy come from, right? Um, and once you know where their energy comes from, then you know how to tap into um, their giftedness. So, if I had a, a gentleman once who was very, very analytical, mm. um, it made me crazy because I sometimes <laughs> I just wanted to move. Um, but I had to understand that that an analysis was very important. Um, so I appealed to his strengths and he was so excited. So where does the excitement come in um, and how do you figure that out on e with each person so that then when you're trying to, to um, come up with actions that people can pursue, that you're really saying, okay, this person is the one who's going to get the analysis done. This is the one who's going to go out and get people excited about this. Yes. This is the one who's going to write the most powerful summary that we need to give to the board. Like, right. and, and people will, it's like playing the sport. You know, like you don't throw the ball to every every team member on the football team. You got to go to the receiver, right? Yes. Um, so you practice to be a receiver and people want to be who they are yep. and they want to be seen for who they are um, and they want they want the enjoyment in their work. So how can you make it possible for someone to say, I'm coming to work today because I'm really excited. I'm going to get to do something really good and yes. I enjoy this work. So I think that's why you do it. Yes. And the enrollment is, I think, an important idea is getting the buy in from someone Right. Uh, and their gift, recognizing their giftedness, where their natural talents and strengths are right. to and help them. If, right. And ask the question, I need you, you know, like, I, I really need your, uh, your best work on this. And when you say I need, um, when you enroll someone or enable them, it's pretty, pretty, pretty compelling. Sure. The, I think that speaks to somebody's ego, to their sense of significance as well. And not in a, right. not in a superficial, shallow way, but no. everybody needs validation. Everybody needs to know that they are adding value. And we say, I need your giftedness here. I need your superpower of analytics or of right. design or of whatever it happens to be. That's that's exactly, I think, what most of us want to hear, that we're recognized for the thing right. that we feel good at and that we love to do. So a right. uh, great way to tie all of that together. Now, tell me about an opportunity that you missed because you held back. Why'd you do it? Um... It's, it's really a difficult question for me. You know, I think about um, my personality and I'm pretty humble. Um, so I, I believe actually that I was ready for the C-suite sooner than I chose to pursue it um, because I'm very loyal to the mission mm. and very loyal to the work that needs to get done. And um, I think I, m I missed that opportunity sooner. Not that I'm sad that I'm in this one now, but yeah. Um, I could have done it sooner. And I think that um, you could I'm have been very... in this C CEO level sooner. And yeah, yeah you held back. Yeah. Interesting. I held back. So, yeah. so why does, why, if it was still in the same organization with the same mission and your loyalty was always there, if you were offered the CEO role earlier for this organization, where does the loyalty to the mission, how does that serve as the, um, I'll call it impediment of sorts. Why did that cause you to hold back? Um, well, I was, uh, before I was in this role here at King Crest as CEO, mm -hmm. I was the chief operating officer in another organization. Oh, you weren't, it wasn't yeah. going to be a promotion. It was going to be yeah. a higher. I, I had got, to it, move. got it, got okay. I would have to, I have to move. And it wasn't, you know, I've, I've always been good at getting out of my comfort zone. That's not the issue. Um, but if I make relationships and connections and I feel like I'm doing really good work. Like, why should I need to go and do good work elsewhere? Mm. Um, but I think what I was missing was the opportunity to really have the full responsibility and the full potential to align things in a way that I think I've aligned things that have never been done before. So 
I wasn't playing to my own giftedness um, yes. because I had a, I had more to offer and I was just not doing it, you know? Yes. Yeah. That's, so. and that the commitment to the mission is such a beautiful thing. I can imagine that anybody yeah. who really loves where they are would always find it hard to leave. It's just figuring out how do we serve right. as many people as possible sometimes. Right. Right. So, love it. Then what about a time when you did decide to take a big risk? What was at stake and how did you communicate that decision to key stakeholders? Um, well, in my last job, we had a tremendous contract loss. So um, the way that it occurred was the, the service itself was being offered by 30 some providers and the state had decided to drop to one or two. Mm. Um, so we had to bid and we came in second place and second place meant no business. Right. So this um, particular division of the company was the only division that was uh, generating a margin. And in reality, in nonprofits, no margin, no mission. Mm. You you have to have some um, money left over at the end of the year to do innovation, do creative things. So all of a sudden, we had no no innovation, and it would have been a devastating blow to the point where we might not have survived as an organization. So we had an opportunity: either grow a new company quickly, um, or basically have to shut um, the organization down. So um, it was scary, um, yeah. but um, we had some conversations, a few of us got together and said, like, what are our choices? And, um, we decided to spin off another company and we had a little better than 90 days to do it. Um, so, um, the way I communicated was pretty much straight up, you know, this is our chance, um, to build something new, uh, that will sustain our mission and serve the people that are going to have a really hard time. Uh, in the new way of the world if we don't do it. Um, so I gave people, you know, I got people to buy in um, very clearly, like what's in it for you and what's in it for the people that we support. Um, so that's what I did. And that's a very short period of time to be able to yeah. conceptualize a new organization. <laughs> Actually, was it a nonprofit or a corporate a corporation? Nonprofit. Or, it so... was an, an, a separate nonprofit under the corporate umbrella of another nonprofit. So <laughs> that's a yeah. lot of layers, and that's a lot, a, of layers. a lot of paperwork and a lot of legal fee, you know, structures and a lot of whatever else to just to yeah. get the structure which is right. not even a physical structure, of course, right. in place, and then to be able to promote it and then to be right. able to do, and you managed to make it happen. And you, did. Mm -hmm. you, you filled the coffers and you filled the service. Yeah. We, my, my boss at the time said, you know, just go get like 300 clients, Mary. And I said, no, <laughs> I want a thousand. Wow. A thousand clients in 90 in days. A thousand clients in 90 days. We enrolled a thousand clients and about 1300, hired 1300 people in 90 days. That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. And um, it was sustainable. It was sustainable. And the the um, the kinds of things that we had to do were, you know, enrolling support again, back to enrolling support mm -hmm. um, in a variety of teams that had to move very quickly and then had to make adjustments to their plans if they weren't working because there was a lot of work to do in 90 days. 90 days, people had to be hired. They had to have tuberculosis tests. They had to oh. pass an exam and all these things. And then we had to make door to door visits to a thousand clients. Um, so we had to come up with some creative ways to do this, um, all with the, you know, basically running out of time. And it was the period of no October, November, and December. Wow. When everybody on the planet is begging for donations and is, is amp and taking time and off, yes. taking time off for family events and, you know, going shopping for holiday gifts and, um, and, you know, participating in their, their church services and traveling to families and, you know, right. this is, you know, that's oh my gosh. great. And so, we did it so by it, New Year's, by New Year's, we had 1100 clients and about 13, 1400 workers. So amazing. Um, yeah. Hire amazing. a company, had to hire the company executive, um, empower a board of directors, you know, mm. borrow $5 million, you Was know, that all, like, all you just little things like that amazing that you were able to galvanize that kind of change. You kind of what wish they had canceled that government contract a lot sooner. I know, you know, it makes you have breakthroughs if there's a crisis, you know, we had the pandemic crisis and no one saw that coming and that right. was a challenge, but um, it was really the same kind of thinking, right. you know, organizing people, making things clear and then uh, making sure that no one feels like they're left alone um, while they're doing it. Right. Wow. That's, that's amazing to go from zero to 
not even 60 to 1100 in in 90 days 1100 5 million those are some pretty big right. numbers right uh, so amazing innovation there and in a nonprofit nevertheless in a nonprofit it's, right it's mm -hmm. crazy um, well i think this is since you took that challenge this is a perfect opportunity to levy a challenge to the audience uh, it's time for our influence challenge of the day so Mary, right. i would love for you to challenge our audience to take one step that they can complete within 24 hours to have more influence how would you like to challenge our listeners today okay so everybody has somebody who said no or they expect is going to say no to something mm -hmm. so imagine one of those things whether it's in personal life or work life and then what i want you to do is go to the balcony pretend like you're not with that person um, and go up and look and see what's going on um, how do you feel what are they feeling what are they thinking what are their interests and then i want you to prepare one question to ask them when you come down from the balcony <laughs> Just one question. And that question has to convince that person that you deeply care about what they have to say. Mm, I love it. I love it. So why balcony? Where'd the balcony come from? The balcony actually comes from an, uh, an author who wrote a book, How to Get Past No. And he said, when someone says no, you cannot engage in an exchange with them at that point. You need to go to the balcony like in a theater and take yourself out of the action and then evaluate and see and hear and feel what's going on so that you don't get caught up in, in a, you know, like basically batting it back and forth. Um, so it's like a pause. And then the idea is to go because you really do care about these people and who say no. You, mm -hmm. you really don't want anybody to say no to you. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to walk away from a situation having someone win and someone lose right. because that never works in the end. So the idea is to make sure that you're not caught up in that exchange and that you take yourself, have a little pause, like take a break, um, and then just get a sense of things and then get down there again. But don't be like shooting them again with your idea. Right. Make sure that they understand that you are hearing them. You do understand that they have feelings and, and expectations and goals of their own and that you've come back in to engage with them. It's so interesting to think about the balcony image as almost like an out-of-body experience. You want to yeah. step outside of yourself, hover mm -hmm you know, 20 yeah. feet up or something and yeah, yeah. just watch the interaction playing. Right. And if you're sitting right. in a theater and analyzing Shakespeare, it's, okay, what is this character thinking? What right. is this character thinking? And why are they not understanding each other? Just to be able to objectively look right. at and make assumptions or guesses or uh, right. inquiries as to what they are really thinking, what's the motivation or the intention right. behind them. And you, you might, you out. might also be able to see yourself better from there. Yes. Um, because, you know, we, we all get caught up in things, you know, where we just keep saying the same thing over and over again, which wasn't helping, but doesn't stop us from doing it. But we do it anyway, you know, instead of saying, wait a minute, you know, how's this working? This is not working. Yes. I need to, you know, have a break and think about this. Like, what do I really feel? What do I want? What do I need? What do they want? What do they need? Mm -hmm. um, but go to the balcony. It's it's fun. It's a fun trip. You know, it's very short. You don't have to go up too many feet. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to spend a lot of time there. One night's fine. Well, and the interesting thing is also that you mentioned often we hear it, we say the same things over and over again. And I can, I, I mean, I can completely throw myself under the bus just in recognizing the number of times I've tried to explain something, whether it's to my husband or to yeah, a colleague yeah, yeah. or to whoever else. And it's like, but I already said this, I've, I've told you this three times. And it's like, okay, well, it might be crystal clear to me that those words have this meaning, yeah, yeah. but for whatever reason, it's mm -hmm. not translating. So saying mm -hmm. it a fourth time, Is it gonna even work? though it should make it, yeah, connect, it just doesn't. So <laughs> we need to find a better path. I don't know why those words are not landing, why those mm -hmm. words do not compute got to find new ones. Let, let's find right. a new path forward. And it is right. amazing how often we get stuck on, but I already said X that right. should right. be crystal clear. and can't tell you why it's not, but clearly it's not. And we just end up yeah. shoulding all over ourselves, which doesn't really. Should, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes, that exactly. Was, by the way, that was in my um, uh, marriage vows. You know, my husband and I wrote our own. Okay. And he said we would not say should, and we would not say assume because, mm. you know, I assumed you were picking up the kids. Well, that's a good work, you know, or, or you should be picking up your own socks, you know, all those kinds of things that create absolutes that yeah. you know, get, in, get in the way of really connecting. Like maybe sometimes I do need help. And I, you know, I need to change the rules for today. Cause you know, I, you know, I'm not feeling well or, or I have a flat tire or something, whatever the case may be. So. Right. Right. 
And how long have you been married? Did you mention it? Um, this year, I'll be married 50 years. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, 50. So yeah. role model on that front. Also, we'll have another conversation <laughs> about that another yeah, day. That's amazing. Yeah. My goodness. You've been married more years than most marriages make in months. Most nowadays. of the people that I most of the people I work with are not alive. When I got married. <laughs> <laughs> well, happy birthday to them and happy yeah, anniversary exactly. to you. That's that's incredible. Talk about leadership on a whole different level. Yeah. Uh, now, was there ever a time when you had to speak up as the lone voice of dissent or disagreement? What happened and how did it go? Um, yeah, I mean, that that has happened in my life more than once. Um, I'm trying to think of one that I, you know, would talk about. Um, the um, There was an employee once who um, uh, wanted a specific job. Um, and the job was uh, included a live-in assignment. Um, and that person, um, was a great choice and, um, her, my boss at the time was not, uh, not the nicest guy at times, mm. <laughs> not the okay. best role model. And, um, I had to stand for her. Um, she, um, uh, was different in his mind and okay. didn't, didn't deserve it. So, um, I was at that point a lone voice and I. I, I actually point blank refused to answer some of his questions about her when um, he asked them because I thought they were not germane to the point. Mm. You know, they had nothing to do with whether she should get the job or not. So when he asked the questions, I just didn't say anything. Interesting. Um, so it was an yeah. interesting, it worked. Um, but, um, but I did take a stand and um, I was at that point, the lone voice advocating for her. And did you, when you say that you said nothing when he asked questions that you thought were inappropriate, was it literally you just stared at him in silence or pretty did much, you pretty oh. much I just stared him down. <laughs> and how did he how did he respond to that? He, you know, he he, he started to peter out <laughs> just like, you know, he came out at me pretty hard, you know, like, um, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And I just like looking at him going and I kept saying the same thing, by the way, she is perfectly qualified. She's had been an excellent employee. Um, I have full confidence in her. And I just kept saying the same thing over and over again. And I just refused. If he just, you know, asked me one more time, I would just look at him like I'd already said that, you know. Yeah. Just stared him, stared, which is really hard for me, by the way. I have really hard times. But I did it on this case because I had to stand for her. And it's it's funny because sitting there in silence is something that is so uncomfortable for most people. It's like nature abhors a vacuum. And yeah. that includes a vacuum in sound. People, uh, at mm -hmm. least in our right. modern kind of American business culture of sorts, it's like anytime there's a the tiniest break, there's this need to fill it with right. sound. And so to allow the silence to just steep right. and and expand that way, there's like force the other person to break these the silence it's such a powerful tool and i think it's one that far too many people don't know right. how to leverage uh, but right. when it's done well it can be really really powerful right so all right well marion this has been an amazing opportunity to speak with you how can people learn more about you and kencrest um go to kencrest.org um you'll find all kinds of wonderful information about us um I, you'll find my blogs there um which you'll learn about me um, but that's where we keep our news. And we also um, are on Facebook, of course. Um, so we put all our current news on Facebook, Ken Crest. Beautiful. And of course, we, and we will uh, also put all those links in the show notes so yeah. people can find them nice and easy. Uh, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Love the examples. And yeah. uh, we're gonna, I hope everybody leverages that silence. It's such yeah. an amazing power. Yeah. And help Lord, people. Lord. And help people enroll in their giftedness. That's that's my big takeaway from today. Thank you so oh, cool. much for joining me today. Thanks. And to, to everyone, and to everybody else, please be sure to uh, thank you, of course, for tuning in. As always, be sure to subscribe if you have not yet done so, so that you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice so we can help even more people to increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations for virtual influence, including my picks for microphones, lights, and more, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. 
I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.